This is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. Hello, friends. Welcome back. Today I am going to continue in a series of talks that I've entitled God's Character and Promises. This is number six in the series. And though I'll do a little bit of review, please do feel free to go back and listen to previous episodes in the series. And along that line, I've mentioned it before, I want to remind you, because I just did a little cleaning up on the YouTube channel for Ask for the Ancient Paths. The YouTube channel has all of the same content, but I realized after somebody asked me about it, that one of the benefits of the YouTube channel is that you can have playlists. And I've done several series on different topics. And if you go to the YouTube channel, which I'll try to link in the description here, you can listen to specific playlists instead of hunting around in the podcast feed for things that are in a series. For instance, I've got a series called Two Kingdoms. That was done maybe a year and a half, two years ago. And if you go to the YouTube channel, then you can just very quickly see the playlist and listen to those in order. I did a series on the covenants. I just finished up a long series, six episodes on money. Then I've got God's character and promises, and this is number six in that series. So please feel free to go to YouTube and look for Ask for the Ancient Paths, and you can click through the resources in that way too. I always assume that people listen to the podcast using a podcast player, But a few people have said that they primarily listen to podcasts on YouTube, and they specifically asked for playlists. So that's another resource that's available to you. Also, as I was preparing today's talk about God's character and promises, I realized that I would like to ask you, the listeners, to send me some of your thoughts about God's character and God's promises. What are the aspects of his character? What are his characteristics that have been most meaningful to you? And what are some of the promises that God has made to you that have really touched your heart? I really would like to hear from you, and a future episode can be based on what you send to me regarding God's character and his promises. So please do send me your suggestions, and you can send those to me by email at the email address ancientpaths at cantrell.cc. The question that we address as we discuss God's character and his promises is the question of where is our faith? Where is our faith rooted? Now, our faith shouldn't be in our ability to understand or to do the will of God. If I were to think, well, I can't really understand God's will, or how can I know God's will? I'm actually putting my faith in my weakness instead of in his ability to break through and speak well. Our faith should not be in ourselves. Our faith should be in God, in him, not just in his teachings, but in him, who he is, how he reveals himself through his word, how he reveals himself by his promises. What is his character? So how does he reveal himself? And What does the Bible have to say about his character and his promises? I've mentioned it before, and I keep coming back to it pretty often. There are three aspects of God's character that are very, very meaningful to me. One is that he brings order from chaos. That is our God. There are actually other world religions, uh, pagan religions, other religions that have gods that are gods of chaos. They sow disorder instead of order. But our God, Jehovah, he brings order from chaos. That's part of his character. Also, our God is a redeemer. He can work in such a way that he can bring people out of slavery. He loves to do it. He loves to redeem people. And he can redeem times and he can redeem emotions. He's a redeemer. He loves to bring things back into the freedom for which they were designed. Another characteristic of our God is that he brings life from death. He's built our spiritual lives in such a way that as we die to ourselves, he brings life from that death. 
And there are a lot of times when we go through things in life where we have to surrender them and die to a certain idea about ourselves or our future or our desires, but then he brings life when we surrender things to him. And so here is a list of other characteristics of his that I've discussed in previous episodes. Our God is wise, and he's faithful, he's loving. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that he is love. Not only does he have a loving character, he actually is love. Our God is just and merciful. Our God is gracious and good. Our God is sovereign and he's holy. And our God is all-powerful, omnipotent. And today I want to talk about a couple of characteristics of his that are in some ways related to one another. First of all, he is immutable. Now, what does that mean? To be immutable means unchanging, that he's the same all the time. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, For I am the Lord, I do not change. That's what God says about himself. He is immutable. He does not change. In James chapter 1, verse 17, James writes, Every good and perfect gift is from above, And comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Amen. Our God is immutable. Our God does not change. I mentioned previously that there are some world religions where their gods sow chaos. And there are religions uh, where gods are always changing their minds. And you can't depend on them. You don't know exactly how they're going to respond at any time. But our God is unchanging. He's immutable. And this immutability of God is a great source of comfort for us who follow him. God does not change his mind. He doesn't change his characteristics. He doesn't change his plan. This immutability gives us a security that's better than any insurance that we could ever buy here on earth. We can depend on our God because he doesn't change. As Jesus said, simply let your yes be yes and your no, no. And our God is like that. He means what he says. His yes is yes and his no is no. The scripture tells us that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. This is a part of his character. God's character is that he doesn't change. He is wise and he's faithful He's gracious and he's good. He's holy and he's immutable. He doesn't change. All of those other characteristics do not change. Amen. And this leads us to this next characteristic of God that I want to talk about. And this is that God is, in addition to being immutable, he is eternal. And this also is in contrast to some world religions where gods were created or born from other gods. But our God is eternal. And, of course, the word eternal means everlasting, something that has no beginning and no end. And Psalm 90, verse 2, speaks about how God is eternal. And this is what it says. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting you are God. Amen. Our God is eternal, and we've got to remember that. Some of us may even take it for granted that he is eternal, but think about it, that he is unchanging and he is eternal. Human beings measure everything in time, and so it's really hard for us to conceive of something that doesn't have a beginning. Everything we know on this earth, our lives included, has a beginning, but he has no beginning. He always has been, and he will continue forever. It is interesting that contemporary science has a similar view of the universe. These philosophers of science, scientists, will say that the universe is eternal. It had no beginning and no end. And yet that's putting faith in material things. So if a scientist can conceive of the idea that material has no beginning and no end, well, certainly we can believe that God has no beginning and no end, even if our minds can't comprehend it. So I'll read a few scripture verses that talk about 
the eternality of God. And of course, we start with the very beginning of the Bible in Genesis chapter 1. It says, in the beginning, God created. So before everything that we know and experience, before anything that was created, God existed. He created all that is, and yet he himself is uncreated, eternally existing. And remember when God revealed himself to Moses, Moses asked God, who shall I say is sending me? And God answered, I am who I am. That's the name that God gives himself. It's this eternal pre-existing self, fully himself. And God depends on no other source. I am who I am. Psalm 102, verse 12 says, But you, O Lord, you shall endure forever and the remembrance of your name to all generations. Amen. God endures forever. Hebrews 13, verse 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, forever. There is his immutability tied in with his eternality. He is immutable and he is eternal. Romans 6, 23 says, The wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. How could he give us a gift of eternal life uh, if he himself is not eternal? (laughs) He allows us to step into that eternal life that he has within himself, that he is the life. Deuteronomy 33, 27. The eternal God is your dwelling place and underneath are the everlasting arms. Amen. Everlasting arms. Immutable and eternal. When we think about time, it's hard for humans to process what it means to be without time. But we can say that time is within the scope of God's creation. He can see the end from the beginning. He promises to fulfill all of his promises in the past in the present, and in the future. And since he is eternal, he can welcome us into eternal life. I don't know, when we step out of time and into eternity, will we be aware of time? Uh, We won't be aging, and yet we'll be aware of events happening. But God is the Lord of time. He is over it, as master of all of creation. Right now, we feel ourselves to be under the governance of the passing of time because we see decay and loss and death. But when we step over into that new life, into the eternal life that God is giving us, then there's a sense of timelessness there. Well, one of the aspects of God being eternal is that he is never surprised by anything. God will never be in a situation where something happens that he wasn't expecting. Something comes along that he was unaware of that existed before him. (laughs) He's not surprised. He looks at everything. He can see the end from the beginning. He knows even the future. He's ordained it, and he's given prophetic words through the scriptures of the ultimate goal of everything, the restoration of all good things. And he's not surprised. He understands it all. And that also is a great comfort for us who follow him. Our God is immutable. He's unchanging. And in that immutability, he is eternal. And so he's a rock and he's a refuge for those who will come to him in humility. Amen. We may not think very deeply about what it means for God to be unchanging and for God to be eternal, but there is so much comfort for us in these aspects of his character. Everyone you know, everyone I know, is not eternal and is changing. (laughs) We're being perfected, we're moving ahead, but we can really depend upon our Lord. We can fully depend on him because he's rock solid. He doesn't change and he goes on forever and ever. And he is the same today as he was when he spoke with Paul, and as he was when he spoke with Abram, and as he was when he spoke with John, this is the same God. 
the same God who walked with Adam and Eve in the garden, the exact same God. He hasn't changed. He's revealed more of himself, but he has not changed. He is the same God. He's the same person. What a comfort to know that Adam and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and John the Baptist and Paul and all the disciples and Aquila and Priscilla and Timothy and all the saints through time have known the same God. He is unchanging. Amen. Well, let me look at one other. I was intending to talk about two of his characteristics, but I'll talk about one more here because I think it ties in with this pretty well. God is omnipresent. I had said previously that he is omnipotent, all-powerful, and now I talk about him being omnipresent, meaning he is present everywhere at all times. In 1 Kings chapter 8, we read, But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you. Amen. He cannot be contained by any one spot or space. Jeremiah 23, verses 23 and 24. Am I a God near at hand, says Jehovah, and not a God far off? Can anyone hide himself in secret places so that I shall not see him, says Jehovah? Do I not fill heaven and earth, says Jehovah? Amen. He fills it all. Psalm 139, verses 7 through 10. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your spirit? If I ascend into heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in Hades, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand shall hold me. Where can we go? to flee from the presence of God. He is everywhere. We can close our spirits off to him. We can refuse to listen to him, but he's there. To be omnipresent means to be always present. Another word is ubiquity. God is ubiquitous. He's always present. He is everywhere present in the fullness of who he is. And this is, of course, then what allows him to interact even in multiple places simultaneously. And I want to point out that Satan is not omnipresent, and his angels are not omnipresent. They can't be in multiple places simultaneously. Satan can't be in many places at one time. His agents can go and do their work. But no creation of God carries this characteristic of being omnipresent. Only God himself is omnipresent. And there's no place that we can go and not be in his presence. And that also is a great comfort for us. Amen. I've thought often, and I've mentioned it here, I believe, if we imagine a, let's say, a Chinese dissident Christian who's locked into a concrete cell, and their Bible is taken away from them, and they're alone in the cell with just a tiny little window up above, and nobody else around them, and the inability to communicate with anyone... Can that Christian be in the presence of God? Absolutely. Of course. Absolutely. I can think of one person who was quite aware of being outside of the presence of the Father. And that was Jesus when he was on the cross. And he said, Father, why have you forsaken me? I think Jesus was all alone because he took on that payment for sin on himself. And part of that payment of death, paying in death is to be separate from God the Father. But we, because of the work of Jesus on the cross, we can always be in the presence of God the Father. There's no place that we can go and not be in his presence. And this truth about the omnipresence of God, that is taught, it's seen throughout the Bible. And the phrase is, I am with you always, That phrase is repeated 22 times in the Old and the New Testaments. I am with you always. And that's what Jesus said when he assured his followers in the Great Commission. He said, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. God is omnipresent. You can always be in the presence of the Lord. How far is it from where you are now to being in his presence? 
I've heard it said, as far as from your knees to the floor. Well, there's some truth in that. But then there's an even deeper truth that God has promised that not only is his kingdom at hand, his kingdom is inside his people. And I can't think of being any closer to anybody than being one with the Lord in spirit and in truth. He is a rock. He's a refuge. He's unchanging. He's eternal. He is ever-present. So let's put our faith in him, not in ourselves. And now I want to turn to God's promises, a few of his promises. And I often come back to Colossians chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, as the purpose for why I have this series of discussions about God's character and his promises. Paul writes to the Colossians, My purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love, that they may have the full riches of complete understanding, in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely, that's Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. That's why I'm talking about God's character and his promises. I really hope that anyone listening to my voice will be encouraged in heart and that we can be united in love for God and for one another and that we can understand deeply who he is. And those riches are just full of treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And his promises have power and they have purpose. Second Peter chapter 1 His divine power has given us everything we need for godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Amen. His power gives us what we need to live the life that he calls us to, and that is through our knowledge of him who called us, our knowledge of Christ himself. And through these things, his glory and his goodness, he has given us very great and precious promises so that through them, you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world that's caused by evil desires. By God's own glory and goodness, he has given us wonderful promises. And by those promises, we can participate in his nature and we can get out of the corruption that's in the world that's caused by our own evil desires. Amen? This is the purpose for talking about his promises. Through these promises, we can participate in his nature. Not know about his nature, but participate in his nature. Now, in previous episodes on this topic, I've discussed Hebrews chapter 13, God's promise, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Amen. Romans chapter 8, that God works for good for those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. That's a beautiful promise. In a recent episode, I talked about John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. A promise of God, if you hold to my teaching, Jesus says, you really are my disciples, and then you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Amen. That's a beautiful promise. James chapter 1, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Amen. That is a great promise. Matthew chapter 6, When you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen, and then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Amen. The beautiful promises of God. James chapter 4. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Amen. That's a really good promise. So now let's look at some other promises that God has made. I want to look at Philippians chapter 4. This has a command, and also a promise. Starting in verse 6 of Philippians chapter 4. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So you see the promise there, and it's interesting. It's a conditional promise. There is a condition for receiving this peace of God that goes beyond our understanding. And the condition is for us to refuse to be anxious about anything. And also, by prayer and petition, with gratitude, present our request to God. 
So there's a conditional promise. If we do these things, then he promises the peace will come to us. And I had this conversation actually recently with somebody, and they're really seeking the peace of God. And the way to do that is to refuse to be anxious about anything. And if the Bible commands us to do anything, that must mean that it's possible to be obedient. And there are a lot of people that get anxious and they think they have no control over it because they think of anxiety as being more of a mood or an emotion that overwhelms them. But the scriptures say, do not be anxious. And that means it is possible for us to not be anxious by God's grace, by his power, that it is possible by our will, with God's help, that we would not be anxious, to refuse to be anxious. So I encourage you, here's the promise. God promises to give us what we need to do what he's calling us to. Don't be anxious. And in addition to refusing to be anxious in every situation, we should pray, we should ask God, but with grateful hearts, hearts full of contentment and praise, and we can present our requests to God. Amen. And then the promise kicks in, and he promises a peace that goes beyond our understanding, goes beyond our minds, and guards our hearts and our minds. That's a good promise. Here's another promise of Jesus found in Matthew chapter 6, and it's related to refusing to be anxious. Jesus says, starting in verse 31, Do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So there's a few things to point out here. First is, again, Jesus is commanding people not to be anxious, not to worry. I probably shouldn't say he's commanding people. He's commanding you and me not to worry, not to be anxious, because our Father knows what we need before we ask him. And we shouldn't be anxious about our next meal or the next drink we're going to have or the clothes that we're going to wear. And Jesus says the unbelievers, they run after those things. They pursue those things. They seek the things of the flesh. And Jesus says, if we seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, then all of that is going to be given to us also. If we seek his kingdom and we seek his righteousness, we are going to find his kingdom and his righteousness. Amen. And all the rest will be given to us as well. He'll provide for our needs. Again, it's a conditional promise of God, but it's a promise that is based upon his character. If we seek first his kingdom, if we seek first his righteousness, he promises to fulfill that seeking and to give us everything else that we're <laughs> hoping for as well. And we shouldn't be like unbelievers who chase after the secondary things. The first thing is his kingdom, his rule, his reign, and his righteousness in us. Amen. Hebrews 11.6 is a scripture that was very, very helpful to me as a young believer. And this is when I began to understand that I had to put my faith in his promises rather than in my weaknesses. And Hebrews 11.6 says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Let's break this down a little bit. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. If we don't act in faith, it is impossible for us to please God. And why is that? Because if we come to him, we've got to believe, first of all, that he exists. That's an attitude of faith, that he really is there. Not that the idea of a God is a helpful idea psychologically for humans who are bound by material reality. <laughs> Not that the idea of God is good, but that he actually exists. That's a step of faith. But that's not all that's a part of this faith that makes it possible for us to please God. We have to believe that he exists and he rewards those who earnestly seek him. And this was the breakthrough for me 
because I really wanted to know God, but I had questions in my heart. Will he really hear me? Will he really answer me? Will he really lead me? Is he really who he said he is? And then I read Hebrews 11.6, and there's this promise. God rewards those who earnestly seek him. He does it. He rewards his people who earnestly come after him. Those who seek his kingdom and his righteousness, he rewards. And without that faith, it's just not possible to please God. What is it to please God? It's to be in relationship with him. He enjoys being in relationship with his people. He loves it. It's pleasing to him. And if we're not drawing close to him, then we can't please him. And anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists. Well, amen, of course. We have to believe that he's there in order to go to him. But we also have to believe that he promises to reward those who seek him with their hearts. I want to make it personal now. You're listening to me. You may be jogging, uh, sitting at your computer. I don't know where you are at this moment, but I want to tell you this promise of God for you. He will reward you when you earnestly seek after him. He's going to do it. He promises to do that. And he gives us that promise and all these other promises so that we can participate in his divine nature. That's why he gives us these great, precious, valuable promises. He doesn't give us these promises so that we can revel in our own sinful nature and enjoy a life that's focused on self. He gives us these promises so that we will enter into his divine nature, and that by doing that, we escape the rot in the world. That's why God gives us these promises. Amen. Well, to wrap it all up, I just want to say again that our faith should not be in our weakness or our inability to hear him well. Our faith needs to be in God, in Jehovah, in him, in his strength, in his character, in his promises. And this is the God that we serve a God who makes promises, who welcomes us into eternal life, who allows us by his promises, by his own glory and goodness, he allows us to enter into his divine nature and to share in that nature with him. And that is the God we serve, and there is no other. Amen. Jesus said to his disciples, Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Thank you for listening, and God bless you all. Thank you.